While in Venezuela, I had an intense experience at an opposition protest, which received wide coverage in the Western press. So I wanted to see the demonstrations that get virtually no coverage, those by government supporters. The atmosphere was quite different. I found the depiction of a widely hated government was a distortion. If Western media and human rights groups consider the voices of anti-government Venezuelans as golden, why are these millions of voices considered to have no value? The opposition's grievances are well reported. This is a perfect example of how John Oliver is twisting facts in this episode. He uses this quote from Reuters to show Maduro has low support. I was curious to see what words were missing from this abbreviated quote, so I went to the source. It turns out the quote isn't saying that he has low support, but that in fact, despite criticisms, he nevertheless has the core support of one-fifth of the population. Core support meaning die-hard, firm supporters that are campaigning for him, active in politics, etc. That's pretty impressive, and doesn't include the millions of Maduro voters who aren't considered, quote, core support. Of course, many more than one-fifth of the voting population came out to vote for Maduro on May 20th. The line is immediately followed by a quote from a Venezuelan saying while he acknowledges that mistakes have been made, he'll still be voting for Maduro to prevent the opposition from turning back the clock on their social gains. Pretty disingenuous, John. And what I can guarantee, for sure, 100%, is if that opposition gets into power and they are able to oust Maduro, you will see some type of Pinochet-like regime in Venezuela. I mean, if we go back to Chile in the 1970s, President Salvador Allende was ousted by Pinochet after about th being in power for three years. And you saw the thousands of people killed, thousands of people tortured by Pinochet. Here you have a revolutionary process that has been very successful since 1999, right? That's about 18 years or so. Can you imagine the bloodletting that will have to happen to overturn that process? It will be, it will be incredible. And I think people need to think about that when they think about their relationship with the Venezuelan process. By the way, I'll note in 2002, when the same people who are running the opposition now were successful in the coup against Chavez, they just threw out the Constitution. They didn't bother having the nicety of a constituent assembly, uh, which people have to remember when they hear them you know, complain about democracy. Since Chavez's death, and since the price of oil has plummeted, the social programs have advanced, and the social programs have been maintained. For example, since Chavez's death and since the plummeting of oil prices, a free quality healthcare has expanded to more of the country, making it available to people in historically uh, left behind and impoverished areas, in particular indigenous areas and the Amazons and so forth, causing the United Nations Program for Development to place Venezuela among the countries with the highest human development index in the world and surpassing most Latin American countries. Since Chavez's death and under Maduro, they reached the goal of building over 2 million new quality housing units for the poor. This is a massive feat in a very short period of time, and it's still moving forward, building about 500,000 new homes a year. And now today, Venezuela has the second lowest rate of homelessness in all of Latin America. How do the sanctions compare to the aid that is being offered? Yeah, the aid is tiny compared to what the sanctions the billions of dollars that are, are lost to the economy. Leading Venezuelan economist is warning of a famine in Venezuela as a result of U.S. sanctions. In a new report, Francisco Rodriguez says U.S. sanctions have crippled Venezuela's oil sector, costing Venezuela about $16.9 billion per year. Rodriguez says a major decline in Venezuela's oil production coincides with the Trump administration's imposition of crippling sanctions in August 2017 and again in January 2019, just as it launched a coup attempt with Venezuela's far-right political opposition. It's, it, this is all a stunt no, for the public opinion, public relations. I mean, if your um, unilateral coercive measures, so-called sanctions, are having an impact in our economy, that has cost more than 23 billion, with B billion dollars, no? How can you're telling us that you're gonna send 20 million dollars of what? That is 
maybe what the restaurants in Caracas need for three days. I mean, that is oh, a spectacle, that is a show for the public opinion. That is only for CNN to broadcast live and CBS and Fox News and the right-wing media all over Latin America and Europe. But the reality is that we, if, if there were, they, they, the United States unblocks our economy, if they waive the sanctions, we have enough resources as to satisfy and oversatisfy the needs of our people. With regard to the current situation, uh, Obama really set the stage with that uh, executive order that you mentioned. Um, and then he created a list of people who were sanctioned and Trump play, you know, built on that. So now, I don't know how many 60, 70 members of the Maduro government are being sanctioned. Now, that- but, the, but the sanctions go even beyond that. So that, like to be able to buy a dialysis machine, you have to use a US bank to, to, to move your right. money. But if the bank says, well, you're being sanctioned, we can't buy the dialysis machine, which may not affect those 60 people. It's, affecting 15,000 people that right. need the machines. So right. the, the sanctions, I'm not sure the technicalities of how they're applied, but well, can't get penicillin, can't get cancer yeah. drugs, can't get, I mean, that's part of the sanction regime. Yeah, I, I'll tell you how, how it's applied. Uh, the, one of the sanctions says that the U.S. financial institutions uh, cannot purchase uh, bonds from the Venezuelan government. So the Venezuelan government cannot refinance okay. its debt. Now, it also affects all kinds of transactions because transactions are in dollars. The world economy is in dollars. So everything goes through U.S. banks. And when Steven Mnuchin, the Secretary of the Treasury, uh, says we're going to track down the funds, the hidden funds, the hidden accounts, the shells, that's the term that's used, um, that creates a sensation that we don't know who's who, so let's not do business with Venezuela. Anybody, right. So Venezuela, in effect, is being, there's a, a boycott. Uh, Venezuela is a nation, and that's affecting the economy in a big way. Venezuela had succeeded in uh, bringing uh, millions and millions of Venezuelans out of extreme poverty. Nobody cared in the 1980s and 90s that there were millions of Venezuelans dying of hunger and malnutrition. No one cared. It's, it, it was a government that was palatable to Washington and a government that was a right-wing government. The moment that a left-wing government came in power, uh, priority number one in Washington was to topple it. Part of the reason that socialism and socialist parties, which, by the way, are part of the government in Portugal today, part of the government in the Netherlands today, part of the government in, the, in Germany, the part of the reason socialism has worked quite well in those countries is because they're not surrounded by enemies trying to undo them every five minutes. Mm -hmm. They're big, they're powerful, and they don't have those enemies. Cuba is 90 miles from the United States, and from day one was surrounded by somebody much more powerful who was interested and disappearing them, that doesn't excuse the mistakes and the terrible things that did happen there, yeah. but it helps you understand why one society has a different experience than another. Socialism means different things to different people. It's not a monolith any more than capitalism is. If I judged capitalism by what you have in Saudi Arabia or the Philippines or some other horrible example, you'd push back and you'd be right. That's not fair. Sí, para hablar, incluso hasta están quemando el país sectores de los terroristas de la derecha fascista, ellos incluso están quemando el país, están, han hecho actos vandálicos, actos terroristas y no se les ha aplicado la ley con esa fuerza como se hace por lo menos en Estados Unidos en Europa, esas personas andan por ahí haciendo lo que quieren aquí la persona tiene libre albedrío, libre forma de pensar, de creer, libre que, de creer lo político, lo económico lo social, lo cultural, lo religioso el que diga que una dictadura está completamente desquiciado, o sea, en qué estado de de dictadura es ese que hay elecciones, que participa la gente, que la gente hace lo que quiere. Eso es completamente ilógico. Este, yo soy una joven 100% revolucionaria, chavista, y creo que lo que están haciendo del lado de, de la derecha, los opositores, no me parece porque creo que los problemas no se resuelven así como lo están haciendo ella de manera violenta, eh, ocasionando un caos en las calles de Venezuela, en las calles de Caracas, este, haciendo, atacando a nuestro, 
a nuestros defensores, a las policías, a las guardias nacionales, creo que eso. Most chilling was the lynching of 21-year-old Orlando Figueroa, who was brutally beaten, stabbed, and burned alive by opposition protesters. According to an interview with Orlando in the hospital, they yelled, hey black guy, see what happens to Chavistas, before throwing a Molotov cocktail on him and lighting him aflame. Orlando died from his injuries just days later. At least four other people have been set on fire but lived, allegedly for being Chavistas. Out of the seven papers, four are anti-government, two are pro-government, and one is neutral, to go either way. So it looks like the press is not as controlled as we think. The next day, I even saw a different paper with the most outrageous headline of all. Trump must take care of Maduro. Television ownership is similar to print media. What do we know about uh, these uh, funds being funneled to Guaido? Well, it's all illegal, of course. I mean, the sanctions that Trump imposed in uh, August of 2017, or you can go back further to the Obama sanctions in March of 2015. These sanctions have always been illegal under the OAS charter, under the UN charter, under uh, the treaties that uh, the US has, various international conventions that the US is a, a party to, and also under US law, because the president has to state in order to impose these sanctions in the executive orders uh, going back to uh, 2015, both Obama and uh, Trump have had to say that the, under our law, that Venezuela poses an unusual and extraordinary threat to the national security of the United States, which everyone knows is false. And so on that basis, it's really not even legal under U.S. law because the president is stating something false uh, in order to comply with the law. This is normal U.S. right-wing foreign policy, nothing different. Uh, this is uh, the same foreign policy that we saw uh, throughout uh, Latin America uh, in the 20th century. It's the same foreign policy that we saw catastrophically in the Middle East. This is Mr. Bolton. This is Mr. Bolton's idea of diplomacy. Uh, this is Trump's idea of diplomacy. You punch someone in the face, you crush your opponent, you try whatever way you can to get your way. It's very simple-minded, it's very crude, and it, Amy, it, it never works. It just leads to catastrophe. So when I was a cadet, what's the first, what's the cadet motto at West Point? You will not lie, cheat, or steal, or tolerate those who do. Mm. I, I, I was the CIA director. We lied, we cheated, we steal, and stole. It's like we, we had we had entire we had entire training courses. Uh, it, uh, it 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 reminds you of the uh, uh, the glory of the American experiment. If you're finding yourself on the same side as Trump, Nikki Haley, and their political equivalents in Venezuela, uh, you have to re-examine your position. I want the Keystone Pipeline. You should love the Keystone Pipeline. Love the Keystone Pipeline. The Keystone XL Pipeline will bring the world's filthiest oil, tar sands from Canada, all the way across the belly of the United States, over our water resources, down to Texas. Oil to Texas? Why in the world would you have to ship oil to Texas? Why? The answer is here in Corpus Christi, home of the Koch Brothers giant refinery. But the Kochs have a problem. They can't use Texas oil. It's not filthy enough. It's not dirty enough for their refinery. They have to use super heavy crude, gunk, like you get from the tar sands. So for years, the Kochs had to import their extra filthy crude from Caracas. And the price of that heavy oil was set by this man, the Frank Sinatra of Venezuela. <laughs> Years ago, President Hugo Chavez told me, Venezuela, with the world's biggest reserve of oil, would really stick it to U.S. customers like the Cokes. Do them. Okay. Okay. Do, what? First of all, eye popping stuff, right? Yes. Didn't know that he had to imp import stuff from Venezuela. Didn't know he had to import the dirty crude from Venezuela. Did not know that that this was had to do with the Koch brothers. They had did not know that. So that was that's great work, right? So what happens is 
people don't know this. The the Cokes have these two these giant refineries, some of the biggest in the United States and the world, mm -hmm. on the Gulf Coast of Texas. They're in the middle of oil fields. So they can't use Texas oil because it's literally not heavy and filthy enough. And so they have to, they have to take almost all their oil from Venezuela, the only place where you can get this super heavy oil. Normally, it's discounted. But because they know the Cokes ah. have to use their oil, Chavez, who was a really bright man, um, had was squeezing the cokes by you know the cojones there uh -huh. and charging them a premium ah. for his oil, and the cokes have been going crazy. They were losing money at their refinery because of the price. So you have two choices: you got to get the XL pipeline, and it's taken too long to get there. So first, they had to get Trump to come in as president and announce and and overcome all of the EPA's objection, everyone's objection, and get the the, the XL pipeline approved. It still ain't there. So what do you do? You better overthrow the government of Venezuela. With some guy named Juan Guaido, who has said, and I quote, I will open up the Venezuela uh, oil fields to American oh. companies. And, and in particular, and, and so you have to understand, Exxon was basically thrown out of Venezuela. They've had lawsuits going against Venezuela. Guaido says he will pay off Exxon and he will let... Uh, let Exxon take control again of the Venezuelan oil fields. That's what this game is about. It's about the oil. And who is this guy, Juan Guaido, by the way? Uh, in Venezuela, white supremacy is a key to Trump's coup. Now, you wrote this in February 8th. So here, you said you can explain this. He can explain this in three pictures. So let's do it. Here's the first picture. Who's that? That's Juan Guaido, uh, nicely uh, shiny white, a little tan, nice tan though, and his his uh, his pale wife and his yeah, uh, they're super and, pale, and super pale. I mean, they're not they're not John Bolton albino, right? But uh, in Venezuela, people with this color skin, they don't even call themselves Venezuelans. By the way, they call themselves Spaniards. Okay? Oh no, and they kidding. are an elite minority that's run the country for four hundred years. Hugo Chavez was the first guy that was that, as he said, he was Negro e Indio. It, it it he was the Nelson Mandela of Venezuela, and uh, when he passed away from stomach cancer, he designated he you know said elect the Maduro. Maduro ran twice and won, uh, who was his vice president. And Maduro is also like Chavez, a dark skinned guy. He was a bus driver. He was one of the you know one of the working people of Venezuela that was getting screwed out of the oil money. This is a fabulously rich nation, but there is Guaido. Um, the, the great white knight chosen by Trump never ran for president. His only qualification seems to be that he's shiny white. Here's another picture. Tell people what this picture is. OK, if you think that this is the meeting of a re, of the Republican Party at the Mar uh, Mar-a-Lago, Mar -Lago. Uh, no, that is the Venezuelan opposition. Those are the deputies, the members of the Venezuelan assembly who are pro Guaido. And as you see, they are lily White. They're it's very important. Keep they, that picture in your there's mind. There's a lot of pink faces in that there's crowd. A, there's a, there's so this is the Trump, the people who are supporting Trump's coup invasion and an intervention yes. in Venezuela. And this is Juan Guaido's Yeah, group. this is, this is so his these, party. So he was head of the assembly uh, with those uh, when those characters. Right? Okay, so now here's, a nut, here's the picture of the people they want to overthrow, which is the Chavistas, which is the, the party of the people, which is the one that Maduro is the head of. And here's a picture of them. You yes. see the difference? Look at the difference. So you see white. <laughs> Wait a minute. There's black. There you go. White. Right. Dark. This is not done by Jimmy Dore's tricky filter business. No. Uh, it, it, it. Now, this looks like a meeting of, you know, the NAACP in Birmingham. I've been to a meeting of the NAACP in Birmingham. Wow, it really does, and, actually. Um, Look at that. So, now, what that looks like is the Venezuelan people. It's a, First of all, the opposition was about 60 members of parliament of their Congress and their National Assembly. This is their d a chamber of deputies. This is about 120 members. And that's about the division in the nation. It's about one third white and and uh, two thirds mestizo, black, indigenous uh, voters of color, and poor people. Okay, this and this is the uh, this is the government supporting group. So this is one thing that the rest of the media has not even touched. It's about a white racist suprematist takeover it's as if um it's like maga except you know make venezuela white again mm. and the and it's very very important to understand this this is one of the reasons why people don't want guaido they don't want a return to what it was effectively apartheid where not only the white people controlled it 
it's not that the darker skinned people are racist. They're saying those people stole our country. They stole the oil money and took it to Venezuela. Excuse me, took it to from Venezuela to Miami, squirreled it away. It was all stolen. It was massively corrupt. It's funny that they talk about Maduro's corruption. He's a bus driver. He lives like, mm-hmm. he, you know, he does. He lives very, very. Simply. Oh no, he's eating steak while everybody yeah. else is. Oh about, yeah, he went to a restaurant. Remember that? But then, he went to a restaurant. Yeah. So what happened is, um, I got to tell you, when I was there, okay. I, by the way, started reporting on Venezuela in 1976, even though that's amazing because I'm only 40. But, right. uh, but uh, it started in 1976 when Caracas was set, surrounded by one million cardboard houses. One million cardboard houses in the nation soaked in oil, cardboard with tin roofs. Chavez came in. They're gone. They're replaced by apartment buildings. Starvation was put to an end. Now, let me quote the CIA. You know that organization, Central Intelligence? They have something called a fact book. And the funny thing about their internal fact book is that they have to tell the truth to themselves within the intelligence community. Their internal fact book says that Chavez came in and reduced poverty, the poverty rate from 50% of the population, half the people were in poverty, to 27%. Basically cut poverty in half, reduced infant mortality, reduced child mortality, increased education, in fact, made it universal, um, and extended health. Yeah, the literacy health. rate really rose. The literacy rate massively rose, and in addition, um, you had basically Medicare for all before America got it. Mass, you know, total, complete uh, medical coverage. I went into the into what were the once the poor areas, now were apartment buildings, and I ran into people who were very anti-Chavez. You know, this big these are very political people, you know. And he was very anti-Chavez. He says, but I have to say, Chavez came in. We have a doctor in the basement of the building. All the kids here go to school. No one's hungry. I will admit that I would rather have someone else there than Maduro or Chavez. But, you know, we have to grant that for the first time, the people got the oil money. How dare they? The oil money was supposed to go to U.S. corporations, the Goldman Sachs, and the rest. And that's, you know, a big part of the issue. And I want to add one other thing there when we get to the oil it's not only the so these people the darker skinned people when you look at those demonstrations as well you showed demonstration at the beginning uh which is very rare because that was from abby martin's site when i was down in venezuela for bbc television the u.s press was doing the same damn thing in 2002 when when they seized chavez and Mm -hmm. kidnapped him they said look at all these anti-chavez marchers and it's true i would go to these marches with like 100,000 uh, anti-Chavez marchers. It was funny. They were like, the women were in high heels. I mean, they, they, the men in business suits. and But there were a lot. There were like 100,000. They were white, and they were rich, and they wanted you to know it. And they're going through the center of Caracas, marching through the shopping center areas. And those, those are the images that we saw on U.S. TV and that's the same stuff we're getting now. The the massive marches. By the way, if it's a dictatorship, whoever allowed massive marches by the opposition? So that was what right? I want. That's what yeah. I keep telling people. They keep saying, well, you have to admit he is a dictator. And I say, first of all, why do you give a fuck if he's a dictator? Who cares? We The United States supports 70% of the world's dictators. That's not why we overthrow someone and, or don't. And, and I, you're just I, re- <laughs> again, you're repeating the CIA pretext for an invasion. Say again. Oh, by the way, yeah, uh, if... Unless I'm wrong, aren't uh, the Saudi royals just <laughs> dictators in bathrobes? Yeah. You know, we call them royals. They're just dictators in bathrobes. Dictator. And don't... I was in other oil countries, com- uh, other oil nations, like Azerbaijan, where there's a... Azerbaijan. Is, Azer- yeah, okay. okay. Uh, you, you can mispronounce it any way you want to. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, is it pronounced it's, Azerbaijan? Well, it depends if you're Azeri. Oh, um, they, that's how yeah. they say it? When I was there. You know, maybe, they, maybe always... they're all f- putting me on. Oh, but anyway, no. but they... All right. Uh, so all right. You don't have to it, fucking do that. It is absolutely a dictator. Greg, <laughs> stop Ali it. The Alive dictatorship. The what Ali... is it? Azerbaijan? Okay, you That's got how it. you pronounce it? She did so good. right in your ear, Greg. Yeah, okay, I'm wrong. <laughs> right in your fucking ear. <laughs> okay. Well, what I know, I didn't speak okay. Azeri, you know, so... Um, but... <laughs> It's, it's their joke for everyone who shows okay, up. Okay. Uh, the um, uh, And then, you know, uh, you know, places like Kazakhstan. These are serious. No, is that, that how you say correctly? Kazakhstan? <laughs> Check it. Check um, it. <laughs> okay. Kazakhstan, Brazil. I mean, but but Kazakhstan is a serious dictatorship, and we love those people, right? We The, the Clintons. Uh, oh, you mean the, the ruling class we love? 
of Kazakhstan. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. The rulers who are, who are murderous dictators. Uh, yes. Um, you know, you've got uh, and these are the people we're supporting. Where is and God forbid you mount a demonstration against the Aliyev family in uh, Azerbaijan or in Kazakhstan against uh, Nazarbayev, these are dictators who you've never heard of because they don't want you to know. That's exactly they right. They don't want you to know about these dictators. We don't overthrow them. We do it. We arm them, we support them, and we help them crush their dissidents. But in, in Venezuela, you will see those opposition demonstrations. They allow 100,000 people into the street to scream and holler and say, overthrow the government. They even allow people there, which they don't allow here, to say, shoot the president, they, kill the president. Yes. They call him the monkey. And they uh, call him, a, which is... Goes right. into the racist memes. Yeah, all the racist memes, and they're always. When I was there, I literally marched with the opposition. I was literally marching along, talking to people. Half of them speak English, uh-huh. and and they uh, thought you're one of them because you're yeah. white. <laughs> yeah, so they thought, hey, so so talking about killing the monkey and and all that stuff, and then you get to the. But what was never shown on U.S. TV, and I finally had to break the even the silence in Britain for BBC by showing the marches that were five times as large, half a million people in Caracas marching in favor of. The government and those groups, those are people in jeans and T-shirts and Mm -hmm. and they are dark skinned almost to a one. And that is something that they don't show you. You saw you saw saw Abby Martin's picture. I mean, it was it's as far as the eye can see. You can these demonstrations and counter demonstrations. It is a thriving, unfortunately, a bit violent democracy. Both sides, everyone in Venezuela has a gun and there's a bit too much shooting not a bit too much. Any shooting is terrible. Yeah. But uh, the idea that there's a dictatorship and and uh, Maduro's gunning down his own people, you have to understand the anti-Maduro people are shooting people. Okay. Yeah, they, so they, that, they, that's what people don't understand is that most people. of the violence is coming from the opposition. It was the opposition that was intimidating people and attacking people who wanted to vote Can and attacking imagine? voting centers. It was the opposition who wanted to make the election illegitimate because they knew they couldn't win. Right. So, the, so what happens is you have this white minority that if you have an election, it's just like South Africa. Yeah. If you have a real election, yeah, they're who's going to win? That's it's right. It's not going to be a white guy. It ain't going right. to be the white guy. Okay. It ain't going to be fucking Juan Guaido. And it's certainly not going to be a guy who says he's working with the oil companies, loves the oil companies. That's right. 